fucking three hour drive in the middle of nowhere. Only accessible by bus. Let's make this quick. <clears throat> Hello? Is this Uncle Boomy Farms? I'm an agricultural climate researcher conducting a survey on... Oh. Hello. Uh, Uncle Boomy, I presume? I'm gonna take that as a yes. Hi, my name is Arthur Function. No relation. Like I was saying, I'm a researcher surveying different farm operations to learn about their conservation techniques. I'm taking a look at irrigation systems, soil conservation, crop planning, all that kind of stuff. And I know that you might have some reservations about this, but hear me out. We're doing this research not just because it's good for the environment, but so our country's farms can be more efficient, sustainable, and profitable. I might even be able to save you some money in the process. So what do you say? Want to take part in our research? I'm gonna take that as another yes. Just show me around your workday and I'll be shadowing around taking notes. Don't mind me, you won't even see me. One hour later. What the hell was that? I read from your file that you're new to this whole farming thing, and I gotta say, it shows. I've been following your work for what has been an unbelievably efficient hour, and I have a few concerns. Namely, that you don't know what the fuck you're doing. But Uncle Boonmi, I like you. I like your strange ominous vibe, so I'm gonna give you a few pointers. Let's talk tilling. That's what you've been doing to the soil with your hoe. Tilling has been a traditional farming practice for thousands of years. The idea is simple. Break up and aerate the soil, kill weeds, and prepare your dirt for planting. And it's got its advantages. Loosening the soil makes it easier for young roots to spread, and turning over organic matter can help with nutrient cycling. Historically, it's been a key tool for increasing short-term yields. But that's a key word here, short-term. Here's the problem with smacking your hoe to the ground like that. When you till, you disturb the complex web of microbial life in the soil. Beneficial fungi and bacteria, torn apart. Earthworms that help with aeration, chopped up. And here's the biggest issue. Tilling releases carbon stored in the soil into the atmosphere as CO2, making climate change worse. Research over the past few decades has shown that heavy tillage depletes soil structure, leading to erosion and loss of organic matter. That means declining fertility over time, which means more fertilizers, more costs, and ultimately, diminishing returns. And none of us want that, right? It's hurting the planet, hurting your profits, and hurting your worms. You don't want to hurt the poor worms, do you? I bet you're real proud of yourself for that one, huh? A lot of modern farms are moving towards reduced tillage or even no-till farming. No-till methods help keep carbon in the soil, retain moisture, and protect against erosion. It basically involves using a machine to stick your seeds straight into the ground. It takes way less work than what you're doing now and save the environment at the same time. A lot of climate researchers are pushing for these conservation tillage practices as a way to make farms more sustainable and resilient against extreme weather events. How does that sound? Love the enthusiasm. Moving on. I see you're using sprinklers here, and not any kind of sprinkler, but lawn sprinklers. I'm honestly a little confused by this. This is an irrigation system designed for suburban single-family houses because they hate community gardens or something, and communities in general. But this isn't your racist grandma's home garden. This is a real-ass farm. Sprinklers may be fine for a small operation, but when you're working on a large-scale farm, a lot of small problems with sprinklers increase exponentially, or linearly, or logarithmically. I haven't done the math. Point is, you're using an irrigation system in a context it was never meant to be used. Let me list out some of the problems with sprinklers. First off, sprinklers are a pressure-based irrigation system. If you don't have water pressure, you're not gonna have the power to spray water all over your crops. You're in the boonies way up in the mountains, so I have no idea how you're getting this much water pressure to begin with, but in a sensible world, you wouldn't be able to use as many sprinklers at all. But most importantly is water conservation. You know what sprinklers do? Sprays little tiny bits of water in the air. And you know what little tiny bits of water in the air do? They evaporate. And sure, all water evaporates, that's a fact of life, but you're accelerating that a ton by using sprinklers. I can't say for sure how much water waste your specific farm is making, because that depends on a whole litany of different factors in the environment. But I can tell you that research shows that up to 40% of water can effectively be lost by using a sprinkler system. 40%! That's an effective shit ton of water! So let's look at some better irrigation systems. There's a lot of different options here, all with their own specific pros and cons, and new innovations are happening all the time. So this is far from exhaustive, but here's a good start. Polypipe irrigation. We take this 100 meter long condom thing, my usual size, and fill it up with water. And, similar to the worst possible first date, we poke it full of little holes for leaks. Water drips directly where it needs to go, reducing waste and runoff. More efficient, less work, and the plants actually get the hydration they need instead of just making the air more humid. And while locally it's a pressurized system, you don't actually need water pressure to operate it. It's practically gravity powered. 
Drip irrigation is even better. It's a network of tubes that delivers water straight to the roots of each plant. This cuts the water waste massively, reduces soil erosion, and prevents weeds from stealing moisture. The crops can suckle from their plastic teat without any competition. Then there's subsurface drip irrigation. Instead of tubes above the ground, the water lines go under the soil, delivering moisture directly where it's needed while minimizing evaporation. It's expensive to install, but it's one of the most water efficient methods out there, perfect for drought prone areas. And given how the climate is going, we're all going to be in drought prone areas soon, am I right? <laughs> Laugh, goddammit! Anyway, for this next part, I'm going to need your cropping records. And because you're clearly no help, I'm going straight to the source. <laughs> What kind of farm is this? I see you're really going all in on these high yield, high profit crops. Big cash crops, every season, no variety, no rotation. Just one single minded pursuit of short term maximum profit. But here's the thing. Every time you plant the same crop in the same place over and over, you're strip mining the nutrients from your own land. Wasting all of your soil. You are slowly killing your farm. Different crops use different nutrients. That's why real farmers rotate their crops. Because if you don't, the soil gets depleted, your yields go down, and suddenly, you're dependent on artificial methods just to keep your land from collapsing into a barren wasteland. You ever hear the Dust Bowl? That little part in your middle school textbook where farmers did the exact same thing you're doing. Planting the same crops non-stop, never rotating, never letting the land rest. They turned the Great Plains into a hellscape of swirling death clouds. The topsoil literally blew away. Whole farms gone. Towns buried. People had to flee their own land because they overworked it to death. And you? You're on the same track. You're farming like someone who thinks that land is infinite, that you can keep on milking it for profit forever. But I've got news for you. If you don't start rotating crops, replenishing nutrients, and thinking long term, then the land will make you pay for it. So yeah, you can keep growing the same crops season after season, watching your yield shrink and your soil turn to dust. Or you can do what actual sustainable farms do. Give the land time to heal. Work with nature instead of treating it like an ATM. Because here's the real kicker. You think you're escaping industrial farming, but you're making the exact same mistakes. You've got the same greed, the same short-term thinking, the same blind faith that the land will keep on giving and giving. The only difference is that they know they're running the business. And the thing is, Boonby, I get it. I see where you're coming from. You see the big superstores like Jojo Mart invading small communities. You see the massive scale of pollution every time you go fishing. And you think, if only we could go back to the way things were. So you regress to a small farm fantasy, where none of these problems exist, and you can treat industrial farming as if it were a backyard project. But the truth is, you can't. Because the system you wanted to go back to was bad too. Humanity may have farmed in a similar way for thousands of years, but do not mistake that for sustainability. It was a system that only seemed like it worked because we lacked the science to measure it. A system where short-term gains took precedence over the future. And part of that was because they had to. They needed food now. And their communities were small enough where the destruction could be ignored. But we can't be ignored anymore. It's a reactionary way to deal with a complex problem. If you care about the environment, if you care about the science, you need to accept that sometimes we do need to scale back. But sometimes we need a big machine too. The solution isn't romantic primitivism. It's science-backed regenerative agriculture. You think your farm is special. That it's different. That because you love the land, that's enough to protect it. But that's the kind of thinking that got us into this mess in the first place. Don't be so concerned with the aesthetic of nature that you miss the bigger picture. At some point, you're going to have to confront the fact that you can't go back to a past life. You need to be a part of the community, helping to build a new one. Hi everyone, this is the end of the video where I talk out of character, so you don't have to listen to my shitty skits anymore. I scripted most of this video about a year ago, and honestly I never really intended to make a video out of it. I have played a lot of Stardew Valley, and I really love it, but after learning more about agricultural science, I just could not resist doing a nitpicky CinemaSin style critique of it. Just like as an excuse to talk about a broader dissonance between the fantasy of farming and real life. But recent events have motivated me to actually make my silly script into an actual video, because I want to put your focus right here, citations. This is the real meat of the video. Because I'm willing to bet you don't really think a lot about the sources you see on YouTube. And I don't really blame you because that's a big time investment, and I often don't pay much mind to them either. So I want to give a special thanks, a real special thanks, to the people who did the actual research that this video relies on. Each of these cited papers either comes from or relies on data from the US Department of Agriculture, as well as most of the non-gameplay footage. It was really useful for this video because it's hard to really conceptualize where our food comes from.
After all, as a society, we tend to fetishize commodities instead of the labor that produces them. And when we do, we tend to think about what we see in the media. There is a degree of separation, of course, but fiction informs us of the reality we do not know. And when our idealized form of agriculture is a small farm, that has consequences. Because the reality is that agriculture is a massive industry involving a global community, even in the most rural small town farms. The USDA, for example, does a lot of scientific research and outreach to ensure food security. Lots of scientists working together to prevent crop disease, protect farmland, and, you know, make sure we keep having food. And right now, they are getting absolutely fucked. Massive layoffs, budget cuts, and other restrictions are currently threatening America's agriculture services. Even banning words during research, including clean water, microplastics, and climate change. And this isn't budget cuts like, oh dang, looks like we're not going to be able to do all the cool projects we wanted this year. It's more like this essential department is probably going to get shut down in the next few months. The Trump administration's Secretary of Agriculture, Brooke Rollins, has been seemingly trying to get rid of as much scientific research as possible to, in her words, support small-scale farms. Which is an absurd statement that only makes sense if you realize that her primary goal is to reinforce the popular media aesthetic of a small farm instead of actually helping them. She wants to promote the horrendously awful idea that a return to quote-unquote traditional values would somehow leave us all better off. But that's not going to happen. Agricultural science, the science of making food, is regressing. If nothing is done, there is a very real possibility that the U.S. food supply is going to get a whole lot less certain, and there's going to be a whole lot less of it. And need I remind you, people need food to survive. And I know that sounds alarmist, but keep in mind that Trump cut the entire pandemic response team two years before the COVID-19 pandemic. So when they try to do the same exact thing for the people in charge of preventing a famine, people dying of starvation, that should be cause for concern. Because I don't know about you, but I like eating food. It has saved my life many times in the past, and I wanted to continue to do so. Now, I don't have a call to action or solution or anything, so you just have to sit with that. Bye.